going. Looks like that. Welcome everyone to Geriatric Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, I am really excited about our speaker today. Um, Dr. Emma Buer is a colleague of ours over in Wyoming. Um, uh, she is with Ivinson Health. She's a geriatrician over there. Um, she's, you know, geriatrics fellowship trained at the University of Colorado um, before she started her work in Wyoming. And she does a lot of work um, that's related to things that we do. So for example, she came and gave um, a talk to the medical students. She does quite a bit of geriatrics education, but she was kind enough to come zoom over to Seattle and do a talk, um, a really fantastic patient interview for the life cycles course that our University of Washington medical students have in the, in the winter. She's also involved with the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program over in Wyoming. She is the geriatrician on their Project ECHO um, that focuses on geriatrics um, and does a lot more. I've heard her speak about some of her great work. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say today. Thank you for taking the time to, to Zoom over to Seattle and talk to us. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is uh, quite an honor. So I really appreciate the invitation. I'm uh, Dr. Emma Bury, like Kate said, and I was asked to speak at Grand Rounds and discuss what it's like to practice geriatrics in Laramie, Wyoming, after a medical student of yours did her rural rotation with me and really enjoyed her experience. I share your students' enthusiasm and hope that after this presentation, you will be able to see why. I don't know where I first heard this saying, and by this point, I've thought about it and said it so many times, I'm beginning to wonder if I even made it up. But the saying as I remembered it was, in geriatrics, an N of one is an N of zero. And how I interpreted this as was, if you're a geriatrician and you're out there on your own, it's not likely you will be able to have a significant impact. And I couldn't disagree more. I have nothing to disclose. Our outline for today, we'll go over our objectives. We'll talk about my personal background, review our case study in geriatrics, talk about benefits of rural practices, as well as challenges of rural practice, and future needs. This is a picture of my husband's granny when she came out to visit my ranch and uh, climbed up on our horse, Jake, and had a thrilling day. Uh, she was 90 years old at the time this picture was taken and said she hadn't been on a horse since she was a teenager. So um, very uh, exciting day. Our objectives are to explore the value of rural geriatrics through a case study, understand the benefits and challenges of rural geriatrics, and realize the importance of rural geriatric care. And this is a photo of my backyard. I grew up in Valley City, North Dakota, a town of around 6,500 people. I appreciated the freedoms and opportunities that this upbringing allowed me. I was able to walk or bike anywhere in town and spend time at my dad's pharmacy, take courses at my mom's university when I was in high school, volunteer at our town's nursing home, and of course, take weekend trips out to grandma's farm. From there, I moved on to a liberal arts college in Minnesota where service learning and developing lifelong learning skills was emphasized. I studied not just biology and chemistry, but Latin and sociology and religion and participated in short educational opportunities abroad. From there, <clears throat> I started my medical school studies back in my home state where there were wonderful health systems and a curriculum which allowed for a thorough study of primary care and rural medicine. I moved on to residency in Denver 
<clears throat> and took care of a very urban population for most of my training there. It was fairly late in residency that I realized my appreciation for older adults was not shared as enthusiastically by everyone around me. And with the growing need for geriatricians, I knew I had to apply for fellowship and dedicate my career to geriatrics. I completed my fellowship, which was the best year of my life at the University of Colorado in Denver. This is what I called geriatric utopia. I was surrounded by brilliant, supportive people who were all working towards a common goal, improving the health, well-being, and lives of older adults. Why would I leave if I could not only work with these people in clinical settings, but work with them on research and teaching and legislation and all of these really big things that most of you are involved in? Backing up to residency for a moment, <clears throat> one of our faculty in residency was also a professor at the University of Wyoming School of Pharmacy, Dr. Lauren Bealey, now Lauren Gorey. She was one of the most influential people in my training, so I did an elective rotation with her. During one of these days, she brought me up to her class in Laramie, Wyoming which was a little over a two hour drive from Denver. It was here the students were exploring different careers in pharmacy. And I met Dr. Tanya Woods, a PharmD with added specialty in geriatrics, who taught at the university and practiced in the internal medicine clinic. After visiting Laramie, I did some research into rural medicine within the state. First, what is the definition of rural? The Census Bureau defines rural as any population, housing or territory, not in an urban setting. The entire population of Wyoming, except for those living in Casper or Cheyenne, are living in rural areas. 17 of 23 counties have fewer than six people per square mile, which is a commonly accepted definition of a frontier area. This includes 47% of the population of the state. Wyoming is also the least populated state in the union, but its older adult population is growing faster than the national average. As you can see here, a snapshot in 2018 to 2019, Wyoming's population age 65 and older grew 3.8% compared to the national average of 0.2%. Stepping back and taking a wider view look from 2010 to 2019, the growth rate of the population 65 and older in Wyoming was 41.5% compared to the US average of 34.2%. What a great state for a geriatrician. A year or so passed since I had visited Laramie and halfway through, and I was halfway through my fellowship, I did more research. And like the true research aficionado that I am, I went to Wikipedia. I looked at Laramie's Wikipedia page and found there were about 30,000 people and only 7.5% over 65 and older. I wondered to myself, could they support a geriatrician? Well, halfway through my fellowship, I boldly showed up to Ivinson's doorstep and asked them if they would like to offer me a job. <laughs> Ivinson was starting a huge period of growth, which I was on the front end of. At the time, excuse me, at the time I made my proposal to Ivinson, their medical group had internal medicine, pediatrics, and a general surgeon. Now, five years later, they have internal medicine, pediatrics, general surgery, OBGYN, 
family medicine, dermatology, ENT, urology, orthopedics, and geriatrics. They also have an excellent and robust oncology team. They continue to grow their visiting providers as well in the fields of cardiology, pulmonology, GI, and neurology. We are all working in the same clinic, which is attached to our emergency room and our hospital. That's pretty incredible. Ivinson not only serves the Laramie community, but smaller surrounding communities. Some people may drive for hours to get the exceptional care provided at Ivinson. This is the fifth year in a row they have been named a top 100 rural hospital. This beautiful 99 bed hospital is pictured right here. So now that I knew I was headed to Laramie, Dr. Woods, my PharmD partner, graciously agreed to come down to my fellowship in order to learn about the Denver Senior Clinic Transitional Care Management Program, which was just one of the initiatives run by our amazing clinical pharmacists there. We were hitting the ground running prior to my start date at Ivinson. While Dr. Woods, is only technically part-time at Ivinson and shares her time with many other Ivinson providers. On top of her professorship at the university and retail work, she has always made herself available to me and our patients on a full-time basis. She is truly superwoman and the person I came to Laramie to practice with knowing she could help me build and lead a team. Shortly after coming to Laramie, doctors McKibben and Carrico at the Wyoming Center on Aging found me and started to discuss goals and resources and support. I learned that we had a GWEP and I was over the moon about partnering with them. The entire community of Laramie welcomed me with open arms and my patient panel quickly filled up. I remember laughing at my earlier question, if Laramie could support a geriatrician. Developing an RN partnership and a program of hiring patient care technicians was also essential to creating a team-based practice. To find our patient care technicians, we started to look for motivated individuals who wanted to work in healthcare during a gap year between undergraduate and their professional school training. We provided them with a unique exposure to geriatrics that so few people have the opportunity. We found these individuals to go above and beyond to learn and care for our patients. My first two techs went to medical school, my third went on to PA school, and my current tech will go on to medical school in the spring. All bringing with them a unique appreciation for the geriatric population. Having never worked in a clinic without a social worker, the first year in practice as an attending was even more challenging. Through creative solutions and WICOA's tremendous support, we were able to start a part-time social worker and then develop that into what will hopefully continue to be a sustainable position through our chronic care management reimbursement. The position is now full-time. As a brand new position, the learning curve was very steep. Thankfully, my pharmacy partner was willing to support and direct our social worker from the early stages of development to any current challenges. And my social worker has done a tremendous job. Through WICOA's continued support, we were also able to offer a pharmacy student a part-time position on our team working on quality improvement projects team support, and chronic care management. All of these positions have enriched our team and our patient's experience. I'd like to spend just four minutes watching this short video on the collaborative practice agreement that I have with Dr. Woods. So please bear with me while I adjust our screen view. 
For providers in rural communities, there's extreme pressure and stress on them to be able to do everything and to know everything and to see everyone. I am not everything that every patient needs. Having a clinical pharmacist expertise is absolutely critical to provide the best possible care for our patients. If we're able to establish a CPA in that setting, it's not only going to benefit our patient population and enhance our quality of care and our patient satisfaction, it's going to support the providers in a way that most likely will lead to less burnout and more sustainability of their practices. The collaborative practice agreement, that's really just kind of a fancy term for a contract or an agreement with another type of healthcare provider. The whole concept is to build team-based care. We no longer exist in silos. There's just no way to accomplish patient care needs these days without implementing some degree of team-based care. So these collaborative practice agreements really enable team-based care. Patients give us feedback that they kind of feel like a superstar because they were able I think this I think the sound might have cut out. Yeah, I can't hear it either. The yeah, the audio dropped out. I'm sorry about that. Gatekeeper for medication safety and detecting errors and doing so much of the in between behind the scenes go between. Unfortunately, it did it again. <laughs> did it cut out? again okay <clears throat> oh it says that you have to stay unmuted because the sound goes away when you mute oh okay clever participants <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys off of the providers that i work with just as much as they bounce things off of me you know, everyone has a different nuance to how they can accomplish something and maybe depending on their skill set, they can be more efficient in that. But everything's a business and ultimately we are trying to decrease costs. And so we need these teams to work together to better care for our high complex patients to overall decrease costs. That's the concept of value-based care. And I think the bottom line is there's going to be more benefits than cash flow. Your patient satisfaction is going to improve. Your quality metrics are going to improve. Provider's ability to produce more and see more patients is going to increase. Maybe my ability to recruit providers is going to increase. And so rural Wyoming and hospital administrators and healthcare administrators shouldn't limit themselves by saying, we're too rural, we're too small, we can't afford that, because you absolutely can. And the benefits far outweigh the cost. I'm very blessed to have the relationship that I do with Dr. Woods. If you have the opportunity to partner with a clinical pharmacist to help support your patients, you should do it you should take that opportunity and run with it. The potential benefits of that collaboration are something that you don't wanna miss out on. Okay, thank you guys for watching that. Give me one minute to reset my screen. Sorry about the audio. Who knew besides the entire audience today? <laughs>
<laughs> so thank you guys. All right, can you see my screen okay? Yep, looks great. So as you can see, and hopefully heard, this partnership has had a huge impact on my ability to practice rural geriatrics. Now that you've had a look at our geriatric team, which I refer to as Team Jerry, I want us to take a look at how this fits into the greater team. Many of these places and people I visited personally prior to starting uh, at Ivinson, introducing myself to the community, and I found that to be very, very helpful. Of course, our patients and their support people are at the center of our teams and this Pac-Man schematic. We're fortunate to have many community resources, which we value as part of the team. Laramie has one post-acute and long-term care facility and one assisted living facility with a memory care unit. They also have one hospice, which offers both inpatient and outpatient support. We do home visits to facilitate our uh, dialogue with these locations on a regular basis. We have a few home health companies who are wonderful to work with and provide us with close updates on our patients. Live is a group of social workers and a psychologist who provide in-home counseling and case management and have been essential partners. Our senior center has been a tremendous support to our patients' well-being through meal services, social gathering, exercise, and other classes. There are several private pay home companies who provide support to our community. One in particular provides the majority of the support. I'm able to provide feedback as a patient would allow to the owner who is wonderfully thoughtful and receptive to suggestions or concerns. Our outpatient therapy departments at the hospital and therapy departments throughout the community are all fantastic. At Ivinson, I'm able to run upstairs to see the patients during their therapy sessions when I'm between visits in the clinic to be able to provide encouragement to them and consult with the therapists. Our community therapists have joined our team meetings and we frequently write thank you notes for all of their wonderful work with our patients. The emergency room and hospital are conveniently located attached to the clinic and I'm able to do what I've been calling my howdy rounds very easily. Having a partnership with the Wyoming Center on Aging has been one of our most important engagements. <clears throat> they not only support our clinic initiatives, which in turn supports our patients, but they support our patients directly with their Dementia Support Center and Healthy You classes, for example. Turning to some of our initiatives since I started at Laramie four and a half years ago. My team and I started a number of successful initiatives within our geriatric program. This is an example of making my N of one count. By coordinating a team of people dedicated to geriatric care and facilitating supportive connections. These initiatives have had a far reaching impact on the medical community in Laramie and its surrounding areas. These programs have offered our patients care that was either previously unavailable or rarely accessed before my practice. Our team's annual wellness visits are nearly entirely completed by our wonderful registered nurse, Peter, who's very close to completing his geriatric certification and our PharmD, Dr. Tanya Woods. These visits allow our patients valuable time with another member of the team and support my schedule, as well as our team billing. These have been extremely well received and enjoyed by our patients. Our chronic care management program has nearly 100 enrollees and bills out around 12,000 per month, which has supported our patients, families and their goals and us in our care coordination. Though everyone participates in this, our social worker does much of the managing 
and builds great care plans with our patients. Our transitional care management program is managed by Dr. Woods and our pharmacy intern, Cody. Though again, our whole team plays an important role in this. Percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation was something I learned about in fellowship at the Eurogyne Clinic, UC Health in Denver. As a non-invasive and non-medication treatment for overactive bladder and urge incontinence, I felt it was important to be able to offer this program to our community as part of a comprehensive bladder program. All of our team is trained in to be able to do this procedure. I started Wyoming's first walk with a doc chapter with Ivinson's generous support when arriving in Laramie. This is a tremendous way for our medical community and our greater community to meet outside of the office and encourage each other towards healthier lifestyle activities. All ages and abilities are invited to join. The whole team has been engaged in this outreach as well. While my patient care technicians have taken the lead on scheduling speakers for our events, coordinating setup and warmups with our wonderful student organization, Exercises Medicine Group. This has been an opportunity for our medical students in Whammy and our pharmacy students to engage in community education. And they are often voluntold to present at a walk. We offer telehealth and telephone visits to our patients as well. <clears throat> with a grant from WICOA, we've been able to supply iPads to patients to support telehealth and other health goal needs. Something I'm extremely proud of is that all of the members of our geriatric team are willing and do provide home visits. I travel to the care center, assisted living, hospice, private homes and ranches, sometimes miles away, at least one day a week with my patient care technician. Our nurse will draw labs, provide vaccinations for homebound patients, as well as other needs that may come up. He once traveled to see a bedbound patient over 45 minutes away. And this was someone who had stage seven dementia, pressure ulcers, and a fully catheter that had fallen out. He was able to provide wound care, replace the Foley, and provide caregiver support <clears throat> in that one visit, something that's pretty tremendous. Our social worker does frequent home visits for needs assessments and support. Our pharmacist does regular visits to high-risk patients to help with medication management and setup. Our pharmacy intern will independently visit patients to check in with them on their health goals and ensure current medication setups after care transitions. The last thing I will highlight is our Institute of Healthcare Improvement age-friendly designation. We were Wyoming's first age-friendly health system, reaching our level two status this last October. I believe we may still be the only site in the state to have this designation. This was truly a team effort. My fabulous patient care technician, McKinsey, and I are presenting a poster at AGS this year on our age-friendly journey and its consequence of doubling our advanced care planning documentations filed per month. Moving on to our educational projects. Throughout the world of geriatrics, there's an important realization that we cannot produce enough geriatricians to meet the needs of the growing aging population. We must therefore educate other providers about the needs of the geriatric community. In practice, due to busy schedules of rural providers, this can be quite challenging, but is another way I try to make my N of one count. I spend time visiting my patients in the emergency room and the hospital and engage with the providers there on the care plans and coordination of care. As mentioned before, the ER and the hospital are part of our patient's care team, though, of course, we try to avoid their involvement as much as possible. 
but being able to share my knowledge of the patient and dialogue about the implications of certain next steps on their quality and quantity of life and in respects to his or her care goals is an important part of education. As mentioned previously, I'm also on the hub team for our geriatric echo, as is Dr. Woods. You are all very aware of the importance and value of echo in teleeducation and can imagine that value expanding to very, very rural settings. All hospital employees are able and access a CAPS fee membership, uh, the Center to Advance Palliative Care, courtesy of WICOA. Palliative care is a huge need in rural communities, and this education has further informed and empowered us in this field. I'm on WAMI clinical faculty, as well as at the Geriatric Fellowship in Casper, Wyoming. We have many clinical students rotate through our team from pre-med all the way to fellows and many pharmacy students. And I also teach our Wyoming cohort, cohort their introductory geriatric lectures. Because there is such a shortage of geriatricians in Wyoming, maybe about three geriatricians in the entire state, I decided to supplement my Ivinson N of one by expanding my reach to include work in Saratoga, Wyoming. Three years ago, I started as the medical director of their nursing home, seeing the nursing home patients and clinic patients one to two days a month. I also cover frequent call and coordinate care between my visits and provide backup support. While Laramie is considered rural, Ivinson has built a tremendous oasis of health services and the community has many support services. Saratoga is rural and frontier. With a population of only 1,700, a beautiful 21.6%, according to Wikipedia, is over 65. They have a small care center with around 20 residents and now two small clinics. They also serve even smaller surrounding areas, including Elk Mountain and Encampment, both with larger proportions of older adults. Saratoga is itself a growing medical community. They did recently get a lab. Previously, they were shipping their blood to Cheyenne, which is nearly three hours away. Still, we cannot get lab work completed on the weekends. They have a volunteer EMS service, and they're currently building a critical access hospital, which is extremely exciting. And I hope they will have great success in staffing as this will help access to care. Saratoga's nearest hospital, is 45 minutes away, though many people choose to come to Ivinson, which is an hour and a half away. In general, Saratoga has a population with conservative goals for their health care. Patients have a minimalistic approach to the cares they seek. They desire to age in place. I recently spoke to a few patients that I have who travel over from Elk Mountain and they have no intention of ever leaving. Why would they? They have lived there their whole lives and continue to enjoy the freedoms of rural living. The population in Saratoga is quite varied when it comes to financial resources. Many folks have very little resources, while some have quite a lot. There is limited home health, palliative care, and even private pay assistance available in this area. In terms of providing care, the medical staff work very hard and have close relationships with their patients. My LPN Lisa is willing to do home visits with me and has done them independently as well to provide wound care and foot care to high-risk homebound patients. While my nurse in Laramie, who's extremely busy, might do two or three visits between all of his other duties, the LPN at Saratoga likely has a full schedule of her own, drawing blood, giving injections, providing wound care, 
and is rooming and triaging for one to two providers. The nursing home, like most nursing homes, especially rural, has had many staffing challenges and turnover, but has been able to maintain a quality home for their residents. I see all of the residents who live there and a nurse practitioner provides care between my visits. We have conducted telehealth visits, which works fairly well when clinic patients come into the clinic. It doesn't work quite as well when we're trying to set things up in their personal homes. Sometimes I fear telehealth visits to our long-term care facility ends up being more work for the staff. And it's also interrupted by low quality internet connections, which is something that we don't always think about in urban settings. There are wonderful benefits to practice in a rural area. At times, our greater health system fails patients due to breakdown in communications. This, of course, can happen anywhere. However, in rural settings, we're fortunate to know everyone and are able to communicate more effectively with other people in our patients' lives. For example, I feel so fortunate to know well and visit with our ER and hospital providers to be able to communicate about those care transitions. And how many of you have had the experience of walking in your clinic past four exam rooms directly into your urologist colleague's office discussing a patient of yours you would like him to see. And he replies, oh, is he still here? I can see him right now. And having him walk to your patient and seeing him in your exam room so he doesn't have to be wheeled over and his family regather their things. That's a pretty special experience. Just like the opportunities I was afforded growing up in rural North Dakota, the ability to practice in a supportive, enthusiastic community has allowed me freedoms to initiate change that I might not otherwise have had. Rural communities and medical facilities can be far more flexible than those in large urban settings, which may fall prey to overly bureaucratic dictates. And this is a picture of my three beautiful donkeys. Challenges of rural, ben of rural medicine are um, wide ranging. Many rural communities lack services that could support an older adult's desire to age in place, particularly in dementia support and at the end of life. There may be few or no resources for getting more support in the home if it isn't coming from family or friends. This has been a challenge in Saratoga, and there's no inpatient hospice near Saratoga. The closest would be Laramie, and that's not acceptable to most people at the end of their life. Not everyone wants to go to a nursing home at the end of their life. However, however we are building a new nursing home as part of the new hospital and are going to prioritize making a comfortable space for those who may need support at the end of life. Weather may often make travel difficult for those who need access. Putting off regular visits is well accepted and expected due to weather and travel concerns. However, having to put off acute visits can be much more distressing for this population. I've had many technology savvy older adults in my practice. However, geriatric patients can be hesitant to participate in telehealth. They may not have internet or even the ability to have reliable internet in these far reaching rural areas. And if they do, they may not be able to or even want to have an appointment over the, over the computer. In my experience, many older adults in rural areas prefer to see their provider face to face, but would engage in telehealth if this was supported. I would be remiss if I did not cover what the majority of us realize in health inequities. A 2015 article in Health Affairs discussed aging in rural America, and like many other documents, discussed the challenges facing rural Americans. 
Often they have lower income and more chronic disease. They want to continue to live where they always have and continue to be independent. Towards the end of the article, they quote Brad Gibbons, the deputy director of the University of North Dakota's Center of Rural Health and a lifelong North Dakotan. He says, if you're 75 or 80 and you're frail, you have less resources to rely on than you would in an urban area. There may be an attitude that it's their problem, they choose to live there. And if you choose to live in rural America, and if you're 80 years old, that basically means you should accept that there will be less for you. But to the point of view of those who advocate for rural America is yes, it is a choice, but do we want to live in a country where there's inequity based on geography? A pretty powerful quote. Just to keep the perspective here, these census graphs show the growing percentage of older adults in rural areas. <clears throat> and as you can see, this is a steeper increase in the rural population than in our urban population. This is a state-by-state -state breakdown over the years 2012 to 2016 where we can see, and I apologize, it's quite small, North Dakota and Wyoming have a much more rural population than the beautiful state of Washington. However, 20% of Washington's population, 65 and over, live in rural areas. I think it's also very important to note that the rural South is a large section of rural America. Rural medicine and rural geriatrics is an experience much greater than the singular case study of my practice. According to the National Rural Health Association's most up-to-date information, we can see, of course, again, the greater rural percent population, 65 and over versus urban. And we can see the number of physicians per 100,000 people 13 physicians per 10,000 in rural settings and 31% of physicians, or sorry, 31 physicians per 10,000 in urban settings. The number of specialists per 100,000 people is around 30 in rural settings, while it's 263 in urban settings. Interestingly, in rural areas, while there's less providers and far fewer specialists, life expectancy is higher in our rural areas than our urban. As I draw to the close of this presentation, I want to reaffirm what we all know. There is a shortage of geriatricians. Approximately 7,300 geriatricians in the United States and 50% work full-time. The shortage is more pronounced in rural areas. An astonishing 90% of geriatricians are located in urban areas. Only 46 geriatricians serve the 435 most rural counties in the United States. That's essentially 10 counties for each geriatrician. This data is from a wonderful JAGS article and is in need of updating. I recognize these numbers are from 2008. However, a more recent article reports the physician workforce in rural areas is declining. And as we know, the older population has been growing since 2008 and much more so in the rural areas. So I feel comfortable stating the country either looks very similar to this now or potentially even worse. Please note all of these light areas are large contiguous areas where no geriatrician is found. Only through an extensive needs analysis and evaluation of the goals and priorities of rural America will we be able to provide better care, not through assumptions. Like any underserved group, 
we need to strive to understand what truly matters most to this population so that we can support it. <clears throat> Thanks to Elon Musk, higher internet speeds on satellite internet is becoming more available and affordable, but we need to continue to support this process and to be able to set up these services for the patients who are interested. I feel so fortunate to be a part of these communities and to work with people who are equally dedicated to our rural older adult population. My hope is that you will continue to explore the importance of rural geriatrics after this presentation. I'd like to acknowledge Sandy, one of your amazing students for her appreciation of geriatric medicine and engagement in her time with me. I'd like to thank Dr. Bennett and Dr. Wang for all of their gracious invitations and allowing me to connect with the community at the University of Washington. Of course, Dr. Woods for her unwavering partnership and the rest of our team, Jerry, and Ivinson Medical Group for providing an environment that fosters growth and improvement, and the Wyoming Center on Aging, particularly Drs. McKibben and Dr. Carrico. Here are my references, and here is your QR code for any questions. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for that awesome presentation. I feel like I've got a really true glimpse into rural geriatrics, and it's great to hear all of the wonderful things you have built out there um, with with your partners. That is just great. Thank you so much. I, I think we have some time for, for questions. If folks want to um, want to unmute to ask them, there were a couple comments in the chat as you were speaking. Um, one was just appreciation for um, the fact that you're practicing geriatrics in Wyoming. Um, and the other was a, a question or comment from Dr. Hansen. And I was just wondering um, it it kind of gets at what is the your sense of the support for uh, additional safety net services in the in rural uh, Wyoming um, from your patients um, and from from others who might not be older adults. Can you sorry? Can you repeat that? This Hi. Yeah. Yeah. This is Dr. Hansen. I'll read the quote. So when you were reading that quote, I um, and uh, forgive me because and then you um, shortly after that. So I'm from Montana, by the way, <laughs> loved the pictures, the slides, and it made me homesick. <laughs> and if I didn't do really fancy schmancy Alzheimer's research that requires a big center, I mean, there are days where I want to go do that kind of work too. You know, I'm in these two worlds, my husband hunts and fishes. I mean, oh my gosh, we would be, we live in Seattle, but our hearts are in Montana. Um, but you know, when you were reading that quote, and maybe I had made an assumption when you were reading it, that there was just a little element of preachiness that sort of liberal elite city people in it. And I'm like, but rural areas keep voting against their self-interest. They keep voting against Medicaid and Medicare expansion, like some of the basic lowest of low bars and low hanging fruit. And that frustrates me. <laughs> so I'm just like, yeah, that would be great. We need geriatricians that where we need this, but we can't even get the basic like lowest of low bar things. And so I don't know exactly what the fix is or how we help that, but like, if you can't get like the basic support and money out there, I mean, like, how do we start? Like, what do you, and I guess what your sense is, did Wyoming vote for the Medicaid and Med Medicare expansions? No, I mean, these are great questions and great points. And I think that um, you know, kind of goes back to not making um, assumptions and really trying to get to know these communities and spending time. And, you know, interestingly, gosh, we have so, um, so many less providers, especially specialty providers, yet that one slide showed life expectancy is actually higher. And so it's very easy for um, people in rural settings to say, hey, you know, here's everything that we have and we love and we appreciate and we want to put that on you and your setting and think that that's going to work. Um, but really spending time, I think, with those communities is what's important and, and those people to figure out what services they really need and what they want. 
Um, I engaged with a, a patient just this week and I asked him and he lives very rurally. And I asked him, Hey, have you ever felt like you wanted more medical care? And he kind of laughed and said, absolutely not. And then he, you know, made some comment about, no, if you cut off a finger, throw it away and move on. Um, it's like, <laughs> I had, and he does have a finger missing. And he, um, and he did mention that, well, one of them was sewed back on and it's been giving me trouble ever since, you know? And so um, I think geriatrics has an appreciation for minimizing specialty care minimizing aggressive interventions, focusing on health and wellness. And I think that that is um, very relatable to rural communities. But that one guy doesn't speak for all people that live in rural areas. There are certainly people that don't want to cut their finger off and that would be better. No. Like, to, <laughs> like oh. I, I still maintain, and, and I don't want to be paternalistic, but I mean, that, you know, Medicaid expansion would just like objectively help all states. I think like this so is much. a very long conversation that could <laughs> take up an hour. And I think Wayne has his hand up if, if we can uh, take Wayne's question. Emma, thanks so much for presenting. It is great. It, you know, what, what comes through in your presentation is your inner glow and enthusiasm and charisma. I'm sure that's why you've been able to accomplish so much, but uh, and thank you for kind of mentioning the business sense of your your intervention and your work, uh, the downstream effects that helped you sell uh, the whole thing to the medical group uh, is is actually works everywhere, not just in Wyoming. But we all want to come visit you. Now I just looked up; it's twelve hundred miles from Seattle to. Laramie. So if we start today, we'll see you Wednesday. I think there's some mountains in the way too. So anyway, uh, what, uh, what I wanted to learn a little more about, you talked about house calls, which is dear to my heart. And you, and you alluded to the fact that you can make a living with what you do, but tell us a little bit about your day-to-day -day, uh, routine. Are you working 80 hours a week? Or do you work pretty regular hours? Uh, how's call work? How, what's Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday look like? One of your days is driving all over the place making house calls, but tell us about the other days and just how it is the same or different than what a geriatrician in Seattle might do. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your kind and generous comments. Um, Towards the beginning of my time at Ivinson, I was probably working uh, 60 hours a week on average. I'm contracted for 36 hours a week, and I'm working very aggressively on uh, improving my efficiency goals and empowering my team to create a more sustainable balance. And I think now I'm probably closer to 45 um, hours a week, which is a tremendous improvement. Um, I see patients at Ivinson Monday through Thursday. I'm in the clinic um, generally all day, Monday through Wednesday, and home visits nearly the entire day on Thursday. That's been growing and growing, that need. Um, one Friday and, and some Saturdays a month, I might go out to Saratoga um, to provide care out there. Um, I am always, especially on Fridays when someone else is covering our phone messages, I'm always available to my patients and my staff. Um, so I'm constantly getting phone calls and doing messages and coordinating things. Um, the emergency room knows that they can contact me anytime and they send me messages and, um, and that can happen even when I'm not taking call for the greater internal medicine group on uh, nights and weekends for phone call. Um, I am uh, you know, engaged in all of our other academic projects and quality improvement projects and and lectures like this that take additional time outside of my uh, clinical practice. So that's kind of a, a snapshot of my typical week. 
Thank you. How many patients do you see on Monday, for instance? Yeah, so I try to keep my um, patients to an average of 12 in a day. Um, home visit days especially can get busier than that. And I might see 18, um, which can sometimes be very busy. I always work through lunch. Um, I fit people in where I need to. And um, we also, I didn't mention at Ivinson have a new convenient care clinic, which is an urgent care, which is, has been improving our patients' access to care as well. But as you know, um, patients like to see their providers when they can. So I do try to keep a couple acute appointments open um, every day. Great, and it looks like um, Amy Thomas is wondering um, if, you've, uh, if you're doing a lot of virtual visits at this point and if that's grown during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, at this point, I am maybe doing a handful a month. Um, there are patients that still request that due to COVID concerns. And there are, I have many patients that either live in Colorado or uh, very rural Wyoming that cannot travel in as frequently as we need to um, have interactions. So telehealth has supported that in a, in a big way. Great, it's almost nine o'clock. I think we have time for one more question if anyone has anything. Um, Grunwald is wondering I, oh, about- oh, oh. Oh, okay. sorry, Kate. Sorry, could, could I ask something? <laughs> um, Emma, thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, I was thinking the same as Wayne. How does this, how does this person get any sleep with everything that she's doing? <laughs> um, but that's not my, my question. <laughs> um, I was curious for the people who um, live really rurally in a place where home health and hospice or private agency would not go to, and they have increased needs. Um, I guess, how, how are you all meeting that needs, especially if they live really, really far away for, for, for you guys to be able to be able to get out there in a timely manner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. <clears throat> so there are reaches of our state where, like you said, there is no home health agency uh, and I can't get an organization to support patients in these settings. And so we've really had to think creatively. A lot of these small towns and areas have wonderful senior centers. And with my collaboration with the Center on Aging and these local resources, we try to think creatively and find people in the community that, uh, that we can pull from. Um, and they might just be um, the, you know, the neighboring ranch next door has um, a, a teenage girl that wants to come and, um, and, you know, expand her, um, her experiences and provide support to, um, to an aging, um, community. So it, it has been extremely challenging. And I, and I feel that there are times where caregivers are at a loss. Um, they're a, a spouse, a, a husband is caring for his wife who has advanced dementia, and gets extremely um, agitated and wanders. And the, the local sheriffs know this person and have found her. And, um, and this husband is crying out for more support and more help. Um, and so trying to provide support from my practice and within my team can be very challenging because we can only do so much remotely. Um, but we do try to be as creative as we can. And I think what's uh, really impressive about rural communities is how um, they look after each other. So um, the, the neighboring community, everyone in these small senior centers, they know each other, they look out for each other. And I think that that really shows a lot of the heart of rural communities. Thank you Great. so much. Yeah. Thank you for this awesome presentation and for answering our questions and, and giving us a window into the great work that you do. Thank you so much. Um, we're right at nine o'clock. Um, if, if folks have follow-up questions, we can always get those to Dr. Biori, um, but, but thank you so much. This was fantastic.
Thank you. you. Thank you everyone for joining and being so engaged. I really appreciate this opportunity.